Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at Virgin Express. If you recall from our previous episode, the collapse of Trans-European Airways led to the formation of two new Belgian-based airlines, European Airlines and Euro-Belgian Airlines. It is with Euro-Belgian Airlines where this story begins. Just days after the November collapse of Trans-European Airways, Euro-Belgian Airlines was formed. Headed by Victor Hassan, the owner of the City Hotels Group, and backed by a Luxembourgian investment company, NEI, this new venture would take over some of the now-deceased TEA's charter flying programme. Hassan would invest 50 million Belgian francs into the venture, with the company trying to pick up as much as possible from the carcass of TEA. The choiciest cut of meat, perhaps, was the support of Georges Gutelman, the original founder of Trans-European Airways, who would now join the airline's board. Three Boeing 737-300 aircraft would join the new airline's fleet ahead of their launch, all of which had been part of the fallen TEA empire. This was particularly convenient for the new carrier, who could simply modify the former TEA livery with a couple of buckets of paint and save themselves some money. Euro-Belgian Airlines took to the sky on April 1st, 1992. The airline would serve a variety of Mediterranean destinations, as well as the Canary Islands, as part of the airline's focus on the inclusive tour, or IT market. The first year went really well for EBA. The airline made a net profit of 60 million Belgian francs on sales of 1.4 billion. An additional Boeing 737-300 joined the fleet in December, with three more arriving in early 1993. One of these aircraft was quickly placed with a new venture, EBA France, as history once again looks set to repeat itself. Things would be slightly different this time around though. The liberalisation of the skies over Europe was finally happening and giving the new venture an opportunity to spread across Europe on its own, unlike TEA which had split ownership of its pan-European empire. Euro-Belgian Airlines was the first airline to take advantage of these open skies when on the 23rd of January one of their Boeing 737s departed Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport on a charter flight bound for Tenerife. A second Boeing 737 would join the EBA France fleet with the pair operating flights out of Paris for a number of French tour operators. Further European expansion began with the formation of EBA Italy in the summer of 1993. Two Boeing 737s were transferred to the new airline's Milan base, although one would only stick around for the summer before moving back to Belgium. 1993 was a very good year for Euro-Belgian Airlines. Aside from the successful launch of its French and Italian subsidiaries, the company also saw its profits steadily increase too. EBA also signed an agreement with British Airways which would see EBA take two aircraft from them on a two and a half year lease from the spring of 1994. Two Boeing 737-400s arrived from BA in April 1994, themselves being almost brand new, having been in service with British Airways for mere months. These would be supplemented by a third aircraft which was brought in from Malaysia Airlines. This aircraft would sport a hybrid livery of its former operator and DBA titles and would leave after the 1994 summer season. 1994 would see EBA France acquire Air Provence, a small French charter airline which had been struggling financially for a number of years and had recently escaped from receivership. The two had formed a partnership at the tail end of 1993 which had seen the two airlines pooling resources including utilising AP's two Sud Aviation Caravelle aircraft. While the EBA France fleet would wear additional Air Provence titles, the two Caravelles would not wear any Euro-Belgian branding. This didn't mean they were going to be leaving the fleet any time soon, however, as they found a lot of work on ad hoc charters. In November 1994, scheduled services were introduced under the brand name EBA Express. These no-frills flights were intended to introduce the US low fare model to Europe. The first EBA Express routes were to Barcelona, Rome and Vienna, with Madrid and Milan being introduced the following year. 1995 began with the closure of EBA Italy and would see that division's sole Boeing 737-300 transferred back to the Belgian fleet. By the summer of 1995 the Euro-Belgian fleet stood at 10 aircraft, 7 Boeing 737-300s and 3 of the larger 400 series variants including the two on lease from British Airways. In November 1995 there was a bit of a reshuffle over in France which would see Air Provence become Air Provence International as well as the formation of Air Provence Charter. 
Contrary to their names, API would focus on the charter flying operated by a small fleet of executive turboprops, while APC would do the mainline flying. Air Province Charter would of course get a shiny new livery. Yep, it was just the EBA livery with a change in lettering. Whoever designed that TEA livery back in the 1980s better have got a good paycheck out of it. As the year drew to a close, several aircraft left the Euro-Belgian Airlines fleet. One 737-400 was shipped off to Futura Airlines of Spain, a 737-300 on a summer lease departed for SATA International, and another 737-300 left to join Star Europe. Star Europe was owned by the tour company Luck Voyages, who EBA had just bought a majority share of. Incidentally, Star Europe would rebrand to Star Airlines and later become XL Airways France. For those of you wondering how I get XL into yet another episode, that's how. The dawn of 1996 saw four aircraft leave the EBA fleet to join their French divisions. Two 737-300s and two 737-400s departed for France. These would be replaced by three other 737-300s which would leave the core Euro-Belgian Airlines fleet standing at seven aircraft. Interestingly, one of the arriving 737s had previously spent a summer with Excalibur Airways, a British charter airline which was formed out of the ashes of Trans-European Airways UK division. Incidentally, the first episode of Grounded actually looked at the rise and fall of Excalibur Airways, so go and check that out. On April 23, 1996, Euro-Belgian Airlines was acquired by Virgin European Airways Limited, a holding company established by Virgin Travel Limited, itself a holding company based in the British Virgin Islands and part of the Virgin Group. Virgin would take a 90% stake in the company for £37.6 million, with financing coming in the form of a £40.1 million loan from within the group. The takeover talks had been going on for a number of months as Virgin wanted to gain a foothold in the European short-haul market, with EBA's growing pan-European presence making them an ideal takeover choice. Virgin had looked at establishing its own Brussels-based airline but decided that the turnkey option of buying EBA was an easier and arguably cheaper solution. The final hurdle was to gain the required approval from the competition authorities. This was merely a formality however, as Virgin Atlantic, at the time the Virgin Group's only airline, didn't operate flights to Belgium. Well, sort of. The Irish-owned CityJet had been operating flights under the Virgin CityJet name since the early 1990s. As part of the franchise agreement, CityJet would pay Virgin to use their name and in return have access to connecting passenger traffic from Virgin Atlantic's long-haul flights. Virgin CityJet would operate flights from Dublin to London City, Heathrow and Stansted. In June 1995, Virgin CityJet launched a new route from Dublin to Brussels. However, the Belgian competition authorities didn't see this as an issue. CityJet themselves did have an issue, however. They believed that passengers may confuse Virgin's rebranded No Frills Euro Belgian operation with their own full-service Virgin CityJet and terminated the contract. The takeover would see the Euro-Belgian Airlines name dropped and the airline rebranded as Virgin Express Airways, or simply Virgin Express. There were changes in the boardroom too, as Victor Hassan and Georges Gutelman departed, with Jonathan Ornstein coming in as both the CEO and Chairman. Once again Georges Gutelman couldn't stay away from the industry and along with Victor Hassan would launch a new airline, City Bird, just a few months later. That of course is a story for another day however. Euro-Belgian Airlines officially became Virgin Express in the spring of 1996. A new and very distinctive livery was adopted, which would see the former EBA fleet sporting a red fuselage and white tail with appropriate Virgin branding. Alongside the new livery was a new direction for the company. At the time of the takeover, roughly 70% of Euro-Belgian's flying was on the inclusive tour charters, with the remainder being EBA's scheduled routes from Brussels to Barcelona, Madrid, Milan, Nice, Rome and Vienna. Virgin Express would shift away from charter flying and focus more on city pairs as part of their plan to expand the former EBA Express low fare short haul airline model brought over from the United States. Their first move was to increase the frequency of flights on the existing EBA Express routes, having reported in their figures for 1995 that they had captured more than 20% of the market on their key routes from Brussels. 
January 1997 would see the arrival of two brand new Boeing 737-400s. These had been ordered by Euro Belgian Airlines prior to the takeover, with Virgin Express firming up the deal later on. They would also be joined by two second-hand 300 series models the following month as Virgin Express really began to expand. Two Boeing 737-200s joined the fleet in May. These were operated by Airfoil, a British-based company which specialised in helping new airlines get off the ground, quite literally too, by offering up its own air operator certificate as well as aircraft. These two aircraft had just been used to launch a then-unknown new airline called EasyJet. On the 29th of May 1997, the Virgin Group would acquire the final 10% of Virgin Express, giving them complete control of the company. During the year, the French operations were wound down. Air Province International had already handed back its 737 fleet and retained a couple of small private aircraft, as well as one Sud Aviation Carvel, the other being withdrawn during the year. The company's other French outfit, Air Province Charter, would cease operations during the year too, with its free 737-300s and sole 737-400 transferring to Belgium and Virgin Express. The wind-down of the French businesses and the handover of their aircraft would allow Virgin Express to expand further. By mid-1997, Virgin Express served Copenhagen, Nice, Milan, Rome, Barcelona, Madrid and both London Gatwick and London Heathrow. The latter two provided an important feeder service to Virgin Atlantic's long-haul operations. 1998 would see a massive rate of expansion for Virgin Express. So much so that extra aircraft were drafted in from all over. Two Airbus A320s were hired from the Irish charter airline, Transair. Both would wear a basic white livery with Virgin Express titles. Incidentally, these were not the airline's first Airbuses, as a single A320 had been drafted in at the end of 1997 from Constellation Airlines of Belgium. Irish ACMI operator Air Taurus would provide Virgin Express with their first wide-bodied jet, an L1011 TriStar. Delivered new to Transworld Airlines in 1973, this TriStar would serve TWA loyally until November 1997 when it headed to the Emerald Isle. It was then given a rather hodgepodge livery consisting of its TWA white with red stripes fuselage and dark blue and red tail with a logo featuring a lion rampant standing atop of a crown. The TriStar would begin operating for Virgin Express from July 1998, however within a month it had suffered an engine fire and was withdrawn. After being ferried to South End it was scrapped, just like the contract with Air Tauras. Virgin Express were forced to find another aircraft quickly and found Sir Freddie Laker happy to help. Laker Airways Inc, Sir Freddie's umpteenth airline venture would provide Virgin Express with a McDonnell Douglas DC-10 to help fill in the gap. Sporting the very smart Laker livery, this DC-10 would operate flights for Virgin Express for around six weeks before heading back to the USA. The spring of 1998 saw speculation that Virgin Express was to acquire and merge with the small British charter airline, Sabre Airways. It had been reported that Virgin were looking at reducing their costs to keep its low fare airline profitable and found the employment laws in Belgium rather restrictive and the wage requirements high. News that Virgin Holidays was to begin a short haul package holiday business certainly added fuel to the fire. The speculation varied from an outright acquisition and merger to Sabre operating some aircraft under the Virgin brand. In June it was announced that a deal had been struck in which Sabre would lease two of its new 737-800s to a newly forming charter airline called Virgin Sun. Unsurprisingly, this came to naught. Sabre did manage to sell Virgin Sun slots at Gatwick and bag £4 million in the process. Virgin Sun would last two years before quietly being shut down. Sabre would rebrand to Excel Airways and develop a pan-European presence of its own until it imploded in September 2008. Virgin Express Ireland was also established during the year. Based in Shannon with the callsign Green Isle, the airline would operate flights to London Gatwick, Stansted and Brussels. It would later add Berlin to its scheduled network, as well as operate charter flights to traditional holiday hotspots around the Mediterranean and Canary Islands. Virgin also returned to France, reactivating Air Provence International under the name Virgin Express France. Not a particularly creative name, I'll admit, but I did like their call sign of Ladybird. Both Virgin Express France and Virgin Express Ireland would operate Boeing 737-300s and 400s shuffled from around the group. 
The continued expansion of Virgin Express into a pan-European low-fare carrier had drawn interest from another low-fare airline with big ambition. Ryanair, then still a long way from becoming the behemoth it is today, approached the Virgin Group with a proposal. Ryanair wanted to acquire Virgin Express and in exchange give the Virgin Group 49% of the combined airline. The deal fell through when Virgin insisted on a 50-50 split leading to Ryanair walking away. Sir Richard Branson mentioned this during an interview on a BBC documentary about business nightmares, taking it on the chin that the deal had cost him billions. While the bearded one did have a laugh about it during his interview, it was an unfortunate mistake in more ways than one. Virgin Express made a loss of 5.7 million euros that year. The charter operations side of the company, which had made up approximately one third of the airline's activities, had become unprofitable due to a combination of rising costs and stagnant revenue growth. They had also begun to complicate the ever-expanding scheduled operation, tying up aircraft and crews which could be used on more profitable scheduled services. It was decided to reduce the charter flying across the board, however, the biggest cut was in France, with Virgin Express France ceasing operations during the year. It was a simple decision. Virgin Express France was entirely a charter operation. Their small size made it difficult to compete against the larger established leisure airlines such as Corsair and Star Europe. It didn't help that the airline didn't operate any scheduled services, not even a feeder route to London connecting with Virgin Atlantic's long-haul operation. There may have been a reason for this, however. Following the privatisation of British Rail, the Channel Tunnel passenger operator, Eurostar, was sold to London and Continental Railways, of which Virgin held an 18% stake. During Virgin's takeover of Euro-Belgian Airlines, Branson was quoted in the press as saying, We would only want to do something with the UK if it is compatible with the train. 1999 had also seen the introduction of the Euro, a single currency for European nations, and as a Belgian operator, Virgin Express would have to switch to this new currency. Like most airlines, the bulk of their financial transactions are being made in US dollars, with fuel and aircraft leasing and maintenance being the primary expenses. Unfortunately, the Euro didn't get off to a great start, sliding heavily against the dollar and increasing Virgin Express's costs considerably. Without going into too much detail, as this is not my area of expertise, while the euro became a real unit of currency in 1999, it wouldn't enter physical circulation for a few years. This, combined with concerns over such a huge project, combining 11 nations' currencies into a single unit, made the euro particularly volatile. The euro would, on average, spend the year 16% worse off against the dollar compared to the year before, and with the cost of fuel trebling, it was needless to say that Virgin Express really didn't need these additional problems. The new millennium was seen by Virgin Express as an opportunity to restructure into a profitable entity. A new management team had joined at the tail end of 1999 with the intention of identifying cost savings and seeking out new opportunities and alliances for the business. While they had the greatest of intentions, it was a horrific year for the company, with Virgin Express making a total loss of an eye-watering 65.2 million euros. 45.5 million of this was from operating losses alone, while 17.7 came from restructuring costs. The restructuring was brutal but necessary to keep Virgin Express in business. All charter flying was dropped in favour of focusing on the low-fared scheduled operations. It was also announced that Virgin Express Ireland was to close by the following spring, as Virgin Express focused entirely on its Brussels operation. This retrenchment would see 11 of the 22 strong fleet deemed surplus to requirements. Four were returned to their lessers, while seven more were subleased, and at least bringing in some revenue for the airline. Part of this surplus was down to five aircraft returning from Virgin Express Ireland. The remainder of the Irish fleet was sent to former TEA Basel outfit, now known as EasyJet Switzerland, or another Virgin venture, Virgin Blue, down in Australia. There were some small positives for Virgin Express during the year 2000. The airline was able to join one of the leading global distribution systems, meaning that travel agencies across the world could now book Virgin Express tickets. Internet bookings also increased 22% up from 15 the year before. This was pretty impressive considering that the internet was still in its infancy and airline web bookings were not particularly common. 
Virgin Express also expanded on an existing agreement with the Belgian flag carrier Sabina. Several years earlier, the two had reached an agreement which saw Sabina bulk buying seats on Virgin Express flights between Brussels and London Heathrow. It had proven to be very beneficial to both parties, as Heathrow was tightly slot controlled and Virgin Express was happy to have some guaranteed revenue from those seats. The new deal expanded to include Virgin Express flights to Barcelona and Rome, giving the struggling Virgin Express even more guaranteed cash. The new millennium also saw an image refresh for Virgin Express. The livery and logo was tweaked slightly to put it in line with the newly launching Virgin Blue of Australia. The airline was not in a particular hurry to repaint the fleet though. 2001 was a somewhat optimistic year for the company. It began with the airline seeing the tail end of the harsh cuts of 2000, the closing down of Virgin Express Island and the axing of the charter division along with the dumping of nearly half of the aircraft fleet. This was the first stage of a three stage program to turn Virgin Express back into a profitable airline. Outlined by the chief executive when announcing the cuts the year before, phase one was to refocus on a Brussels hub serving eight major European cities. Phase 2 was to improve the quality of the product, which saw Virgin Express become the best performing on-time airline at its Brussels hub as well as at Copenhagen, Madrid and Rome. The third phase was expansion. Virgin Express had started the year serving eight core routes with flights to Barcelona, Copenhagen, London, Madrid, Malaga, Milan, Nice and Rome. By the end of the year, four more destinations were added with Geneva, Stockholm, Gothenburg and Faro joining the Virgin Express route network. Crucially, Virgin Express was given a lifeline from its parent company. Well, sort of. Virgin Group Investments Limited, through one of their subsidiaries, Barfair Limited, would provide Virgin Express a credit facility of 35.5 million US dollars. Virgin's optimism was becoming a reality. The retrenchment to Brussels and those brutal cuts were paying off with the airline on course to make a very tidy profit. Unfortunately, this was 2001 and we know what happens next. The September 11th attacks would of course affect Virgin Express just like they affected every other airline globally. In the case of Virgin Express, it was a bit different. The airline was of course affected by the disruption caused, but as a wholly European airline, this disruption was fairly minimal. Passenger figures also remained reasonably steady under the circumstances. It was November when Virgin Express would be hit the hardest. The Belgian flag carrier Sabina collapsed in early November due to a combination of the fallout from 9-11, bad financial management and broken promises from Swissair. The cause of Sabina's demise is not up for debate today, however Virgin Express had just seen the demise of their largest competitor and unfortunately their biggest customer too. The previously mentioned deal which saw Sabina bulk buying seats on Virgin Express flights had made Sabina the largest single customer of Virgin Express, accounting for over 40% of the airline's revenue. A former regional affiliate of Sabina, known as DAT, or Delta Air Transport, with the help of a consortium of Belgian businessmen would take over the majority of Sabina's assets and routes. DAT quickly rebranded as SN Brussels Airlines. For the sake of clarity, I'll mostly refer to them as SNBA from here onwards. With SNBA picking up the pieces of Sabina's collapse, it meant that Virgin were once again facing larger competition on their home turf. The industry had changed though. Could Belgium really sustain two competing homegrown airlines? The two companies almost immediately began looking into a merger, believing that they stood a much better chance of survival in the changing industry as one unit rather than two competitors. Discussions began in November and lasted until February 2002 when the two airlines decided to follow their own independent paths. Both parties had looked closely at each other's operation, with Virgin Express seen as offering a value for money approach to flying for business and leisure travellers and SNBA offering a more conventional scheduled airline approach. It was decided that the two airlines would not be a good fit and thus they went their separate ways. Despite the events of the year, Virgin Express closed out 2001 with an average load factor of 80% and made a profit of €130,000, with the airline's director reporting that the collapse of Sabina had cost them €10 million Euros in guaranteed income for the year. As the bankruptcy of Sabina dragged on, their receivers and Virgin Express lodged various claims against each other. 
Virgin Express filed a claim for 269 million euros against Sabina for both amounts outstanding as well as for their early termination of contracts. Sabina, on the other hand, filed two claims against Virgin Express, a punctuality claim of 7 million US dollars and a fraud claim of 102 million euros. The fraud claim sounded juicier than it was. In reality, it was alleged that the managers of Sabina who signed contracts with Virgin Express were not valid representatives of the airline. Needless to say, that claim got tossed out pretty quick, and in the end, all parties settled for peanuts. Expansion was seen as the key to sustained profitability. Virgin Express was able to resurrect the former Sabina deal, albeit not on the same terms, but it was a big boost to the struggling carrier's coffers. Several new routes were added, with Athens, Lisbon and Bordeaux joining the Virgin Express route network. The Balearic island of Mallorca saw Virgin Express return during the year too. The airline resurrected the route as a low-fare leisure route rather than a conventional charter flight. Virgin Express and SMBA had established a kind of symbiotic relationship, and for Virgin Express to grow it was clear they needed to expand beyond the Belgian border. July 2002 saw Virgin Express announce its intention to open a base in Colne, its first base outside of Brussels since the closure of their Irish and French operations a few years prior. Virgin planned to base up to 20 aircraft at Colne. Unfortunately, shortly after Virgin's announcement, two competitors announced their intentions to enter the market. Eurowings, already an established airline, announced that it was to base a new low-fare airline at Colne, with this new airline being named German Wings. Hapag Lloyd announced the formation of their own low-fare airline, Hapag Lloyd Express, which would also join the freight at Colne. Both German Wings and Hapag Lloyd Express had big backers, Lufthansa in the case of the former and TUI for the latter. Virgin Express knew that they were unable to survive the inevitable fare war between the three airlines and thus was forced to abandon its plans before they had even got started. Virgin Express shifted its attention once again to France, eyeing up a potential return to the country just a few years after closing down their Parisian operation. The independent Air Lib, formed through the merger of Air Liberté and AOM French Airlines, had, after several months of fighting off bankruptcy, finally been grounded. This gave Virgin Express an opportunity to restart its French operations. Virgin initially looked at acquiring the assets of the bankrupt Air Lib as part of a joint venture with a French shipping firm, but instead opted to start afresh. Virgin Express planned to base 12 aircraft at Paris Orly Airport and applied for 25,000 slots at the airport which had been released thanks to Air Lib's demise. Unfortunately, Virgin Express were awarded just a fraction of that, receiving 5,840 slots which was barely enough to operate three routes from Paris. If that wasn't bad enough, these slots were pre-allocated to serve Bordeaux, Toulon and Rome of which only one was likely to be remotely profitable in the near term. The slot timings also severely hampered aircraft utilisation, which in turn would greatly reduce the profitability of the French operation. With Virgin Express looking at operating just a single route from Paris, it was left with no option but to cancel their revived Virgin Express France venture. Virgin Express would once again be forced to focus on its Belgian hub, seeing an opportunity to draw in more passengers who sought a value for money experience on short haul flights, rather than paying more for a scheduled flight at a time when scheduled carriers were cutting back their service in an effort to stay afloat. There was good reason for optimism too, as Virgin Express had made a profit of €400,000 for the year. 2003 was a challenging year for Virgin Express. The airline made a loss of 19.6 million euros despite carrying 5% more passengers than the year before. Virgin Express had carried 2.5 million passengers during the year and had an average load factor of 81%. While this was impressive, it wasn't particularly good for the airline. Virgin Express had rather tight margins and was losing on average 8 euros per passenger. The deal between Virgin Express and SNBA collapsed in March, meaning that Virgin Express lost a considerable amount of guaranteed revenue. A new deal was brokered between Virgin Express and a small regional airline, VLM. Set to last for one year, VLM would continue to operate its Brussels to London City Airport route, but would now offer a code share with Virgin Express. Virgin Express also secured a deal with the Dutch travel company, Budget Air, which would see Virgin Express operate a daily flight from Amsterdam to Rome. 
The Iraq war also led to a downturn in passenger numbers across the industry. Virgin Express were able to keep its passenger figures high by lowering ticket prices, however the scheduled carriers were doing the same. Those larger and more established carriers were able to heavily discount tickets on routes that competed against Virgin Express, with the ticket prices cut so low that they were in fact making a loss on each ticket sold. Those airlines could get away with it though by cross-subsidising from more profitable long-haul routes or from business class ticket sales. Virgin Express needed to cut costs. One aircraft was returned to the lesser with a replacement brought in on a lower rate. The airline also renegotiated the leasing fees for the rest of the 11 strong aircraft fleet. Staff numbers were cut, particularly within the reservations department, as the airline drew in more and more bookings via the website. The airline's fuel costs increased as a side effect of the Iraq war, however, the conflict did provide the airline with one benefit, the strengthening of the euro against the dollar. As mentioned earlier, an airline's primary expense such as fuel, maintenance and aircraft leasing fees are all paid in US dollars. With the dollar sliding heavily against the euro, it helped Virgin Express reduce their losses simply because the currency exchange rate was advantageous, at least for a little while. Once again, it was not all doom and gloom for Virgin Express. The airline had been awarded Best Short Haul Airline of the Year for the second consecutive year by a Belgian travel trade magazine. Virgin Express also boasted industry-leading punctuality, in Europe at least, with an average on-time arrival performance of 93.4% for the year. Towards the end of the year, Virgin Express and SM Brussels Airlines once again began tentative talks with regards to a merger. Virgin Express had, during the year, been approached by a third-party investment bank which had spotted ways in which the two airlines' operations would complement each other under common ownership. These talks would continue well into the new year. The spring of 2004 saw Virgin Express withdraw two of its Boeing 737-400s, bringing their fleet to a total of 11 aircraft. The pair were deemed surplus to requirements following the airline's decision to either reduce frequencies on loss-making routes or ax them altogether. Virgin Express axed its Bordeaux route in favour of launching a new service to Valencia, as once again the airline was forced to fend off competition. Milan, Rome and Barcelona were all hit hardest by the competition and the resultant fare wars, but Virgin Express held on. Internet bookings hit an all-time high during the year, with 70% of Virgin Express bookings coming from the website. The average load factor dropped to 76%, however Virgin Express was able to reduce their operating losses to 3.9 million euros. This was a clear sign that things were improving, though questions remained as to how long the losses could go on for. On October 6, 2004, it was announced that Virgin Express and SN Brussels Airlines were to come under common ownership. SN Air Holding, which was SNBA's parent company, would take ownership of Virgin Express on April 12, 2005. In return, Virgin would take a 29.9% stake in SN Air Holding. This is quite a drop compared to the previous merger talks, where Virgin reportedly wanted a 50-50 split, though they were now in less position to argue given their financial woes and shrinking fleet. The two airlines would operate as separate entities, as after all, they offered two completely different products. They would, however, begin code-sharing in a third and final resurrection of the old Sabina deal, albeit now expanded across both airlines' route networks. Speaking of route networks, Virgin Express expanded theirs with the introduction of Catania, Palermo, Mercia and Bari. The fleet didn't increase in size however, they just got better utilisation out of their existing fleet and dropping frequencies on other routes where SMBA could fill in the gaps. Despite things seemingly getting better and better for Virgin Express, it was clear to those behind the scenes that it made more financial sense to combine the two airlines into a single operation. On the 31st of March 2006, it was announced that SM Brussels Airlines and Virgin Express were to merge the following year. The new airline was to be given the very imaginative name of Brussels Airlines and would be a near total refresh for the Belgian flag carrier. The stylized S logo that was formerly used by Sabina was replaced by a B. That's a letter B, not a bumblebee. Save that for buzz. While the basic tone of the livery resembled Sabina's final livery, the colours were updated and the styling adjusted slightly while still looking smart. The only real remnant of Sabina to carry over was the airline's IATA code of SN. 
For Virgin Express, it meant that their entire brand would be lost, though this in itself was beneficial to the new airline. Virgin licenses out its name and branding. Usually these deals are based on a percentage of income rather than profit, so by dropping the Virgin name, the new airline could save a small fortune. For instance, in 2003 Virgin Express shelled out €913,000 in royalties. Dropping the name completely was easily a great way of saving Brussels Airlines some money. On the 25th of March 2007, Virgin Express and SN Brussels Airlines officially merged into a single airline. The Virgin branding was quickly dropped in favour of the new Brussels Airlines branding. The 10-strong Virgin Express Boeing 737 fleet was retained by Brussels Airlines, who themselves had a large fleet of Avro regional jets forming the backbone of their short-haul operations. Brussels Airlines would eventually phase out the Boeing fleet by 2012, and with it, the last remaining remnants of Virgin Express. So, what went wrong? Well, this episode has gone on far too long, so I'll keep it very brief. Nothing particularly went wrong, as after all, Virgin Express did not go bankrupt. It merged with its main competitor, which frankly was the best possible outcome for the two airlines. Belgium, and Brussels in particular, are just not able to sustain two medium to large size airlines calling the place home. While the two may go head to head on some routes, don't forget that there'll be competition coming from the other end too. For example, Alitalia, the perennially bankrupt national airline of Italy was competing against both Virgin Express and Sabina on some routes and was clearly losing money. Alitalia always made a mockery of European Commission regulations on state aid and their Milan and Rome routes were no exception with the flag carriers selling tickets for far below the cost price of what Virgin Express and their lower cost base could operate at. Then there was Ryanair. Back in the early 2000s, they were still finding their feet and were hardly the pan-European behemoth that we love to hate today. Ryanair had begun serving shallower airports in the mid-90s with flights from the UK and Ireland. However, by the early 2000s, the airline had opened up a base at what was marketed as South Brussels Airport. The airport was in fact around 40 miles south of Brussels, which was close enough by Ryanair standards. Ryanair were always a tough negotiator when it comes to airport fees, and Shallower was no exception. The airline got a reduction in landing fees and rebates for using some of the airport facilities. These were, believe it or not, perfectly normal. However, since Shallower was owned by the local government, Virgin Express argued that it was tantamount to state aid and cried foul to the European Commission. Virgin Express liked to complain a lot about subsidies and illegal competition. Their yearly accounts would go to great pains to complain about how Sabina was collecting a fortune in state aid. Ironically, Sabina was chucking a considerable amount of money at Virgin Express, between 10 and 30 million euros per year thanks to their cooperation agreement. Arguably, it's quite possible that Virgin Express wouldn't have lasted as long as it did had Sabina not given them such a lucrative contract. The EC would eventually side with Virgin Express in order that Ryanair pay most of it back, but then, after Ryanair protested, another court ruled that it was okay all along. It was a bit of a moot point really though, Ryanair had only competed with Virgin Express on three routes, and given how Ryanair served airports miles away from their actual destination, it wasn't really competition at all. It goes back to my original point. Belgium cannot sustain two medium to large airlines calling the country home. The only way that Virgin Express could have lasted longer on its own was to expand overseas, ironically, the way Ryanair did and still does. Unfortunately, Virgin Express was just not up to the challenge. When competition came sniffing round their potential new bases, the airline retreated to the safety and boredom of Belgium. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions or criticisms, please do get in touch. If you don't have a YouTube doodah, don't worry, I've got a contact form on my website. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter as well. I have plenty more episodes in the works, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land. And as always, thanks for watching.